The Sane Society by Eric Fromm. This is chapter five, which I'm doing in three parts. So this is part one. Man in Capitalistic Society. The Social Character. Mental health cannot be discussed meaningfully as an abstract quality of abstract people. If we are to discuss now the state of mental health in contemporary Western man, and if we are to consider what factors in his mode of life make for insanity and what others are conducive to sanity, we have to study the influence of the specific conditions of our mode of production and of our social and political organization on the nature of man. We have to arrive at a picture of the personality of the average man living and working under these conditions. Only if we can arrive at such a picture of the social character, tentative and incomplete as it may be, do we have a basis on which to judge the mental health and sanity of modern people, or of modern man? What is meant by social character? I refer in this concept to the nucleus of the character structure which is shared by most members of the same culture in contradistinction to the individual character in which people belonging to the same culture differ from each other. The concept of social character is not a statistical concept in the sense that it's simply that it is, sorry, that it is simply the sum total of character traits to be found in the majority of people in a given culture. It can be understood only in reference to the function of the social character, which we shall now proceed to discuss. Each society is structuralized and operates in certain ways, which are necessitated by a number of objective condi conditions. These conditions include methods of production and distribution, which in turn depend on raw materials, industrial techniques, climate, size of population, and political and geographical factors, cultural traditions, and influences to which society is exposed. There is no society in general, but only specific social structures which operate in different and ascertainable ways. Although these social structures do change in the course of historical development, they are, rel they are relatively fixed at any given historical period, and society can exist only by operating within the framework of its particular structure. The members of the society and or the various classes or status groups within it have to behave in such a way as to be able to function in the sense required by the social system. It is the function of the social character to shape the energies of the members of society in such a way that their behavior is not a matter of conscious decision as to whether or not to follow the social pattern, but one of wanting to act as they have to act and at the same time finding gratification in acting according to the requirements of the culture. In other words, it is the social character's function to mold and channel human energy within a given society for the purpose of the continued functioning of this society. Modern industrial society, for instance, could not have attained its ends had it not harnessed the energy of free men for work in an unprecedented degree. Man had to be molded into a person who was eager to spend most of his energy for the purpose of work, who acquired discipline, particularly orderliness and punctuality, to a degree unknown in most other cultures. It would not have sufficed if each individual had to make up his mind consciously every day that he wanted to work, to be on time, etc., since any such conscious deliberation would lead to many more exceptions than the smooth functioning of society can afford. Nor would threat and force have sufficed as a motive, since the highly differentiated tasks in modern industrial society can in the long run only be the work of free men and not of forced labor. The necessity for work, for punctuality and orderliness, had to be transformed into an inner drive for these aims. This means that society had to produce a social character in which these strivings were inherent. The genesis of the social character cannot be understood by referring to one single cause, but by understanding the interaction of sociological and ideological factors. Inasmuch as economic factors are less easily changeable, they have a certain predominance in this interplay. This does not mean that the, that the drive for material gain is the only or even the most powerful motivating force in man. It does mean that the individual and society are primarily concerned with the task of survival, 
and that only when survival is secured can they proceed to the satisfaction of other imperative human needs. The task of survival implies that man has to produce. That is, he has to secure the minimum of food and shelter necessary for, for survival. And the tools needed for even the most rudimentary processes of production. The method of production in turn determines the social relations existing in a given society. It determines the mode and practice of life. However, religious, political, and philosophical ideas are not purely secondary projective systems. While they are rooted in the social character, they in turn also determine, systematize, and stabilize the social character. Let me state again, in speaking of the socioeconomic structure of society as molding man's character, we speak only of one pole in the interconnection between social organization and man. The other pole to be considered is man's nature, molding in turn the social conditions in which he lives. The social process can be understood only if we start out with the knowledge of the reality of man, his psychic properties, as well as his physiological ones. And if we examine the interaction between the nature of man and the nature of the external conditions under which he lives and which he has to master if he is to survive, if he is to survive. While it, is, while it is true that man can adapt himself to almost any conditions, he is not a blank sheet of paper on which culture writes its text. Needs like the striving for happiness, harmony, love, and freedom are inherent in his nature. There are also dynamic factors in the historical process which, if frustrated, tend to arouse psychic reactions, ultimately creating the very conditions suited to the original strivings. As long as the objective conditions of the society and the culture remain stable, the social character has a predominantly stabilizing function. If the external conditions change in such a way that they do not fit any more with the traditional social character, a log arises, which often changes the function of character into an element of disintegration instead of stabilization, into dynamite instead of a social mortar, as it were. Provided this concept of the genesis and function of the social character is correct, we are confronted with a puzzling problem. Is not the assumption that the character structure is molded by the role which the individual has to play in his culture contradicted by the assumption that a person's character is molded in his childhood? Can both views pretend to be true in view of the fact that the child in his early years of life has comparatively little contact with society as such? Uh, I don't think that's true. This question is not as difficult to answer as it may seem at first glance. We must differentiate between the factors which are responsible for the particular contents of the social character and the methods by which the social character is produced. The structure of society and the function of the individual in the social structure may be considered to determine the content of the social character. The family, on the other hand, may be considered to be the psychic agency of society, the institution which has the function of transmitting the requirements of society to the growing child. The family fulfills this function in two ways. First, and this is the most important factor, by the influence the character of the parents has on the character formation of the growing child. Since the character of most parents is an expression of the social character, they transmit in this way the essential features of the socially desirable character structure to the child. The parents' love and happiness are communicated to the child as well as their anxiety or hostility. In addition to the character of the parents, the methods of childhood training, which are customary in a culture, also have the function of molding the character of the child in a socially desirable direction. There are various methods and techniques of child training which can fulfill the same end. And on the other hand, there can be methods which seem identical, but which nevertheless are different because of the character structure of those who practice these methods. By focusing on methods of child training, we can never explain the social character. Methods of child training are significant only as a mechanism of transmission, and they can be understood correctly only if we understand first what kinds of personalities are desirable and necessary in any given culture. The problem then of the socioeconomic conditions in modern industrial society, which create the personality of modern Western man, 
and are responsible for the disturbances in his mental health require an understanding of those elements specific to the capitalistic mode of production of an inquisitive society in an industrial age. Sketchy and elementary as such a description by a non-economist must necessarily be, I hope it is nevertheless sufficient to form the basis for the following analysis of the social character of man in present-day Western society. The structure of capitalism and the character of man. A. 17th and 18th century capitalism. The economic system which has become dominant in the West since the 17th and 18th centuries is, is capitalism. In spite of great changes which have occurred within this system, there are certain features which have endured throughout its history, and with reference to these common features, it is legitimate to use the concept of capitalism for the economic system existing throughout the whole this whole period. Briefly, these common features are 1. The existence of politically and legally free men. 2. The fact that free men, workers, and employees sell their labor to the owner of capital on the labor market, by contrast. 3. The existence of the commodity market as a mechanism by which prices are determined and the exchange of the social product is regulated. 4. The principle that each individual acts with the aim of seeking a profit for himself, and yet that, by the competitive action of many, the greatest advantage is supposed to accrue for all. While these features are common to capitalism throughout the last few centuries, the changes within this period are as important as are the similarities. While we are most concerned in our analysis with the impact of the contemporary socio-economic structure on man, we shall at least briefly discuss the features of 17th and 18th century capitalism and those of 19th century capitalism which are different from the development of society and man in the 20th century. Speaking of the 17th and 18th centuries, two aspects must be mentioned which characterize this early period of capitalism. First, that technique and industry were in the beginning compared with the development in the 19th and 20th centuries. And second, that at the same time, the practices and ideas of medieval culture still had a considerable influence on the economic practices of this period. Thus, it was supposed to be unchristian and unethical for one merchant to try to lure customers from another by force of lower prices or any other inducements. In the fifth edition of the Complete English Tradesman, 1745, it is stated that since the death of the author Defoe in 1731, this underselling practice has grown to such a shameful height that particular persons publicly advertise that they undersell the rest of the trade. The Complete English Tradesman, 5th edition, cites a concrete case in which an overgrown tradesman, who had more money than his competitors, and thus was not forced to use credit, bought his wares directly from their producer, transported them himself, instead of through a middleman, and sold them directly to the retailer thus enabling the latter to sell the material for one penny cheaper per yard. The comment of the complete tradesman is that the result of this whole method is only to enrich this covetous man and to enable another man to buy his cloth a little cheaper, a very small advantage which is in no relation to the damage done to the to or done to the other businessmen. We find similar prohibitions against underselling and ordinances in Germany and France throughout the whole 18th century. It is well known how skeptical people were in that period toward new machines, inasmuch as they threatened to take away work from man. Colbert called them the enemy of labor, and Montesquieu says esprit de loi, that machines which diminish the numbers of workers are pernicious. The various attitudes just mentioned are based on principles which had determined the life of man for many centuries. Most important of all was the principle that society and economy exist for man, and not man for them. No economic progress was supposed to be healthy if it hurt any group within the society. Needless to say, this concept was closely related to, tra to traditionalist thoughts 
in so much as the traditional social balance was to be preserved, and any disturbance was believed to be harmful. B. 19th century capitalism. In the 19th century, the traditionalistic attitude of the 18th, of the 18th changes, first slowly and then rapidly. The living human being with his desires and woes loses more and more his central place in the system, and this place is occupied by business and production. Man ceases to be the measure of all things in the economic sphere. The most characteristic element of 19th century capitalism was, first of all, ruthless exploitation of the worker. It was believed to be a natural or social law that hundreds of thousands of workers were living at the point of starvation. The owner of capital was supposed to be morally right if, in the pursuit of profit, he exploited it to the maximum the labor he hired. There was hardly any sense of human solidarity between the owner of capital and his workers. The law of the economic jungle was supreme. All the restrictive ideas of previous centuries were left behind. One seeks out the customer, tries to undersell one's competitor, and the competitive fight against equals is as ruthless and unrestricted as the exploitation of the worker. With the use of the steam engine, division of labor grows and so does the size of enterprises. The capitalistic principle that each one seeks his own profit and thus contributes to the happiness of all becomes the, the guiding principle of human behavior. The market as the prime regulator is freed from all traditional restrictive elements and comes fully into its own in the 19th century. While everybody believes himself to act according to his own interest, he is actually determined by the anonymous laws of the market and of the economic machine. The individual capitalist expands his enterprise not primarily because he wants to, but, beca but because he has to. Because, as Carnegie said in his autobiography, postponement of further expansion would mean regression. Actually, as a business grows, one has to continue making it bigger, whether one wants to or not. In this function of the economic law which operates behind the back of man and forces him to do things without giving him the freedom to decide, we see the beginning of a constellation, which comes to its fruition only in the 20th century. In our time, it is not only the law of the market which has its own life and rules over man, but also the development of science and technique. For a number of reasons, the problems in organization of science today are such that a scientist does not choose his problems. The problems force themselves upon the scientist. He solves one problem, and the result is not that he is more secure or certain, but that ten other new problems open up in place of the single solved one. They force him to solve them, he has to go ahead at an ever-quickening pace. The same holds true for industrial techniques. The pace of science forces the pace of technique. Theoretical physics forces atomic energy on us. The successful production of the fission, fission bomb forces upon us the manufacture of the hydrogen bomb. We do not choose our problems. We do not choose our products. We are pushed. We are forced. By what? By a system which has no purpose and goal transcending it, and which makes man its appendix. We shall say a great deal more about this aspect of man's powerlessness in the analysis of contemporary capitalism. At this point, however, <clears throat> at this point, however, we ought to dwell a little longer on the importance of the modern market as the central mechanism of, distrib of distributing the social product since the market is the basis for the formation of human relations in capitalistic society. If the wealth of society corresponded to the actual needs of all its members, there would be no problem of distributing it. Each member could take from the social product as much as he likes, or needs, and there would be no need of regulation except in the purely technical sense of distribution. But aside from primitive societies, this condition has never existed up to now in human history. The needs were always greater than the sum total of the social product, and therefore a regulation had to be made on how to distribute it, how many and who should have the optimal satisfaction of their needs, 
and which classes had to be satisfied with less than they wanted. In most highly developed societies of the past, this decision was made essentially by force. Certain classes had the power to appropriate the best of the social product for themselves, and to assign to other classes the heavier and dirtier work, and a smaller share of the product. Force was often implemented by social and religious tradition, which constituted such a strong psychic force within people that it often made the threat of physical force unnecessary. The modern market is a self-regulating mechanism of distribution, which makes it unnecessary to divide the social product according to an intended or traditional plan, and thus does away with the necessity of the use of force within society. Of course, the absence of force is more apparent than real. The worker who has to accept the wage rate offered him on the labor market is forced to accept the market condition because he could not survive otherwise. Thus, the freedom of the individual is largely illusory. He is aware of the fact that there is no outer force which compels him to enter into certain contracts. He is less aware of the laws of the market which operate behind his back, as it were. Hence, he believes that he is free, when he actually is not. But while this is so, the capitalist method of distribution by the market mechanism is better than any other method devised so far in a class society, because it is a basis for the relative political freedom of the individual, which characterizes capitalistic democracy. The economic functioning of the market rests upon competition of many individuals who want to sell their commodities on the commodity market. As they want to sell their labor or services on the labor and personality market, this economic necessity for competition led, especially in the second half of the 19th century, to an increasingly competitive attitude, characterolo characterologically speaking. Man was driven by the desire to surpass his competitor, thus reversing completely the attitude characteristic of the feudal age, that each one had in the social order his traditional place with which he should be satisfied. As opposed to the social stability in the medieval system, an unheard of social mobility developed in which everybody was struggling for the best places, even though only a few were chosen to attain them. In this scramble for success, the social and moral rules of human solidarity broke down. The importance of life was in being first in a competitive race. Another factor which constitutes the capitalistic mode of production is that in this system, the aim of all economic activity is profit. Now around this profit motive of capitalism, a great deal of calculated and uncalculated confusion has been created. We have been told, and rightly so, that all economic activity is meaningful only if, it, only if it results in a profit, that is to say if we gain more than we have spent in the act of production. To make a living, even the pre-capitalist artisan had to spend on raw material and his appearances wage, or sorry, and his apprentice's wage, less than the price he charged for his product. In any society that supports industry, simple or complex, the value of the saleable product must exceed the cost of production in order to provide capital needed for the replacement of machinery or other instruments for the development and increase of production. But the question of the prof profitableness of production is not the issue. Our problem is, is that our motive for production is not social usefulness not satisfaction in the work process, but the profit derived from investment. The usefulness of his product to the consumer need not interest the individual capitalist at all. This does not mean that the capitalist, psychologically speaking, is driven by an insatiable greed for money. This may or may not be so, but it is not essential for the capitalistic mode of production. In fact, Greed was much more frequently the capitalist's motive in an earlier phase than it is now. When ownership and management are largely separated, and when the aim of obtaining higher profits is subordinate to the wish for the ever-growing expansion and smooth running of, the, of an enterprise. Income can, under the present system, be quite apart from personal effort or service. The owner of capital can earn without working. 
the essential human function of exchange of effort for income can become the abstracted manipulation of money for more money. This is most obvious in the case of the absentee owner of an industrial enterprise. It does not make any difference whether he owns the whole enterprise or only a share of it. In each case, he makes a profit from his capital and from the work of others without having to make any effort himself. There have been many pious justifications for this state of affairs. It has been said that the profits were a payment for the risk he takes in his investment or for a self-depriving effort to save, which enabled him to accumulate the capital he can invest. But it is hardly necessary to prove that these marginal factors do not alter the elementary fact that capitalism permits the making of profits without personal effort and productive function. But even as far as those who do do, or who, sorry, those who do work and perform services, their income is not in any reasonable correlation to the effort they make. A school teacher's earnings are but a fraction of those of a physician, in spite of the fact that her social function is of equal importance and her personal effort hardly less. The miner earns a fraction of the income of the manager of the mine, though his personal effort is greater if we consider the dangers and discomforts connected with his work. What characterizes income distribution in capitalism is the lack of balanced proportion between an individual's effort and work and the social recognition accorded them. Financial compensation. This disproportion would, in a poorer society than ours, result in greater extremes of luxury and poverty than our standards of morals would tolerate. I am not stressing, however, the material effects of this disproportion, but its moral and psychological effects. One lies in the under-evaluation of work, of human effort and skill. The other lies in the fact that as long as my gain is limited by the effort I make, my desire is limited. If, on the other hand, my income is not in proportion to my effort, there are no limitations to my desires, since their fulfillment is a matter of opportunities offered by certain market, market situations, and not dependent on my own capacities. 19th century capitalism was truly private capitalism. Individuals saw and seized new opportunities, acted economically, sensed new methods, acquired property, both for production and consumption, and enjoyed their property. This pleasure and property, aside from competitiveness and profit, uh, profit-seeking, is one of the fundamental aspects of the character of the middle and upper classes of the 19th century. It is all the more important to note this trait because with regard to the pleasure in property and in saving, man today is so markedly different from his grandfathers. The mania for saving and for possession, in fact, has become the characteristic feature of the most backward class, the lower middle class, and is much more readily found in Europe than in America. We have here one of the examples where a trait of the social character which was once that of the most advanced class became, in the process of economic development, obsolete as it were, and is retained by the very groups which have developed the least. Characterologically, the pleasure in possession and property has been described by Freud as an important aspect of the anal character. From a different theoretical premise, I have described the same clinical picture in terms of the hoarding orientation. Like all other character orientations, the hoarding one has positive and negative aspects. And whether the positive or the negative aspects are dominant depends on the relative strength of the productive orientation within the individual or social character. The positive aspects of this orientation, as I have described them in Man for Himself, are to be critical economical, careful, reserved, cautious, tenacious, imperturbable, orderly, methodical, and loyal. The corresponding negative aspects are to be unimaginative, stingy, suspicious, cold, anxious, stubborn, indolent, pedantic, obsessional, and possessive. It can be easily seen that in the 18th and 19th centuries, when the hoarding orientation was geared to the necessities of economic progress, the positive characteristics were predominant, while in the 20th century, 
when these traits are the obsolete feature of an obsolete class. The negative aspects are almost exclusively present. The breakdown of the traditional principle of human solidarity led to new forms of exploitation. In feudal society, the Lord was supposed to have the divine right to demand services and things from those subject to his domination. But at the same time, he was bound by custom and was obligated to be responsible for his subjects, to protect them and to provide them with at least the minimum. The traditional standard of living, feudal exploitation took place in a system of mutual human obligations and thus was governed by certain restrictions. Exploitation as it developed in the 19th century was essentially different. The worker, or rather his labor, was a commodity to be bought by the owner of capital, not essentially different from any other commodity on the market, and it was used to its fullest capacity by the buyer. Since it had been bought for its proper price on the labor market, there was no sense of reciprocity or of any obligation on the part of the owner of capital beyond that of paying the wages. If hundreds of thousands of workers were without work and on the point of starvation, that was their bad luck, the result of their inferior talents, or simply a social and natural law which could not be changed. Exploitation was not personal anymore, but it had become anonymous, as it were. It was the law of the market that condemned a man to work for starvation wages, rather than the intention or greed of any one individual. Nobody was responsible or guilty. Nobody could change conditions either. One was dealing with the iron laws of society, or so it seemed. In the 20th century, such capitalistic exploitation, as was customary in the 19th century, has largely disappeared. This must not, however, becloud the insight into the fact that 20th century as well as 19th century capitalism is based on the principle that is to be found in all class societies, the use of man by man. Since the modern capitalist employs labor, the social and political form of this exploitation has changed. What is not changed is that the owner of capital uses other men for the purpose of his own profit. The basic concept of use has nothing to do with cruel or not cruel, ways of human treatment, but with the fundamental fact that one man serves another for purposes which are not his own, but those of the employer. The concept of use of man by man has nothing to do even with the question whether one man uses another or uses himself. The fact remains the same that a man, a living human being, ceases to be an end in himself and becomes the means for the economic interests of another man, or himself, or of an impersonal giant, the economic machine. There are two obvious objections to the foregoing statements. One is that modern man is free to accept or to decline a contract, and therefore he is a voluntary participant in his social relation to the employer, and not a thing. But this objection ignores the fact that in the first place he has no choice but to accept the existing conditions, and secondly, that even if he were not forced to accept these conditions, he would still be employed, that is, made use of for purposes not his own, but of the capital whose profit he serves. The other objection is that all social life, even in its most primitive form, requires a certain amount of social cooperation, and even discipline and that certainly in the more complex form of industrial production, a person has to fulfill certain necessary and specialized functions. While this statement is quite true, it ignores the basic difference. In a society where no person has power over another, each person fulfills his functions on the basis of cooperation and mutuality. No one can command another person except insofar as a relationship is based on mutual co cooperation, on love, friendship, or natural ties. Actually, we find this present in many situations in our society today. The normal cooperation of husband and wife in their family life is to a large extent not any more determined by the power of the husband to command his wife as it existed in older forms of patriarchal society but on the principle of cooperation and mutuality. 
The same holds true for the relationship of friends, inasmuch as they perform certain services for each other and cooperate with each other. In these relationships, no one would dare to think of commanding the other person. The only reason for expecting his help lies in the mutual feeling of love, friendship, or simply human solidarity. The help of another person is secured by my active effort as a human being to elicit his love, friendship, and sympathy. In the relationship of the employer to the employee, this is not the case. The employer has bought the services of the worker, and however human his treatment may be, he still commands him, not on a basis of mutuality, but on the basis of having bought his working time for so many hours a day. The use of man by man is expressive of the system of values underlying the capitalistic system. Capital, the dead past, employs labor, the living vitality and power of the present. In the capitalistic hierarchy of values, capital stands higher than labor, amassed things higher than the manifestations of life. Capital employs labor and not labor capital. The person who owns capital commands the person who only owns his life, human skill, vitality, and creative productivity. Things are higher than man. The conflict between capital and labor is much more than the conflict between two classes, more than their fight for a greater share of the social product. It is the conflict between two principles of value, that between the world of things and their amassment, and the world of life and its productivity. Closely related to the problem of exploitation and use, although even more complicated, is the problem of authority in 19th century man. Any social system in which one group of the population is commanded by another, especially if the latter is a minority, must be based on a strong sense of authority, a sense which is increased in a strongly patriarchal society where the male sex is supposed to be superior to and in control of the female sex. Since the problem of authority is so crucial for our understanding of human relations in any kind of society, and since the attitude of authority has changed fundamentally from the 19th to the, to the 20th century, I want to begin the discussion of this problem by referring to a differentiation of authority which I made in Escape from Freedom, and which still seems to me valid enough to be quoted as a basis for the following discussion. Authority is not a quality one person has in the sense that he has property or physical qualities. Authority refers to an interpersonal relation in which one person looks upon another as somebody superior to him. But there is a fundamental difference between a kind of superiority-inferiority relation, which can be called rational authority, and when one which may be described as inhibiting or irrational authority. An example will show what I have in mind. The relationship between teacher and student and that between slave and slave owner and slave are both based on the superiority of the one over the other. The interests of teacher and pupil lie in the same direction. The teacher is satisfied if he succeeds in furthering the pupil. If he has failed to do so, the failure is his and the pupil's. The slave owner, on the other hand, wants to exploit the slave as much as possible. The more he gets out of him, the more he is satisfied. At the same time, the slave seeks to defend as best he can his claims for a minimum of happiness. These interests are definitely antagonistic, as what is, as what is of advantage to the one is detrimental to the other. The superiority has a different function in both cases. In the first, it is the condition for helping of the person subjected to the authority. In the second, it is the condition for his exploitation. The dynamics of authority in these two types are different too. The more the student learns, the less wide is the gap between him and the teacher. He becomes more and more like the teacher himself. In other words, the rational authority relationship tends to dissolve itself. But when the superiority serves as a basis for exploitation, the distance becomes intensified through its long duration. The psychological situation is different in each of these authority situations. In the first, elements of love, admiration, or gratitude are prevalent. The authority is at the same time an example with which one wants to identify oneself partially or totally. 
In the second situation, resentment or hostility will arise against the exploiter, subordination to whom is against one's own interests. But often, as in the case of a slave, his hatred would only lead to conflicts which would subject the slave to suffering without a chance of winning. Therefore, the tendency will usually be to repress the feeling of hatred and sometimes even to replace it by a feeling of blind admiration. This has two functions. One, to remove the painful and dangerous feeling of hatred, and two, to soften the feeling of humiliation. If the person who rules over me is so wonderful or perfect, then I should not be ashamed of obeying him. I cannot be his equal because he is so much stronger, wiser, better, and so on than I am. As a result, in the inhibiting kind of authority, the element either of hatred or of rational overestimation and admiration of the authority will tend to increase. In the rational kind of authority, the strength of the emotional ties will tend to decrease in direct proportion to the degree in which the person subjected to the authority becomes stronger and thereby more similar to the authority. The difference between rational and inhibiting authority is only a relative one. Even in the relationship between slave and master, there are elements of advantage for the slave. He gets a minimum of food and protection which at least enables him to work for his master. On the other hand, it is only in an, in an ideal relationship between teacher and student that we find a complete lack of antagonism of interests. There are many gradations between these two extreme cases, as in the relationship of a factory worker with his boss, or a farmer's son with his father, or a, a housefrau with her husband. Nevertheless, although in reality the two types of authority are blended, they are essentially different, and an analysis of a concrete authority situation must always determine the specific weight of each kind of authority. The 19th century social character is a good example of a mixture between rational and irrational authority. The character of society was essentially a hierarchical one, no longer like the hierarchical character of feudal society based on divine law and tradition, but rather on the ownership of capital. Those who owned it could buy and thus command the labor of those who did not, and the latter had to obey under penalty of starvation. There was a certain blending between the new and the old hierarchical pattern. The state, especially in the mon mon monarchical form, cultivated the old virtues of obedience and submission to apply them to new contents and values. Obedi obedience in the 19th century middle class was still one of the fundamental virtues and disobedience one of the elementary vices. At the same time, however, rational authority had developed side by side with irrational authority. Since the Reformation and the Renaissance man had begun to rely on his own reason as a guide to action and value judgment, he felt proud to have convictions which were his, and he respected the authority of scientists, philosophers, historians, who helped him to form his own judgments and to be sure of his own convictions. The decision between true and false, right and wrong, was of the utmost importance, and indeed both the moral and intellectual conscience assumed a paramount place in the character structure of 19th century man. He may not have applied the rules of his conscience to men of a different color or even of a different social class, yet to some extent he was determined by his sense of right and wrong, and at least by the repression of the awareness of wrongdoing, if he did not succeed in avoiding wrong action. Closely related to this sense of intellectual and moral conscience is another trait characteristic of the 19th century, the sense of pride and mastery. If we look today at the pictures of 19th century life, the man with the beard, the tall silk hat, and walking cane, we are easily struck by the ridiculous and negative aspect of 19th century male pride, a man's vanity and naive belief in himself as the highest accomplishment of nature and of history. But especially if we consider the absence of this trait in our own time, we can see the positive aspects of this pride. Man had the feeling of having put himself into the saddle, so to speak, 
of having freed himself from domination by natural forces, and for the first time in history having become their master. He had freed himself from the shackles of medieval superstition, and even succeeded in the hundred years between 1814 and 1914 in creating one of the most peaceful periods history has ever known. He felt himself to be an individual, subject only to the laws of reason, following only his own decisions. Summing up, then, we may say that the social character of the 19th century was essentially competitive, hoarding, exploitation, authoritarian, aggressive, individualistic. Anticipating our later discussion, we may already emphasize here the great difference between 19th and 20th century capitalism. Instead of the exploitative and hoarding orientation, we find the receptive and marketing orientation. Instead of competitiveness, we find an increasing tendency toward teamwork. Instead of a striving for ever-increasing profit, a wish for a steady and secure income. Instead of exploitation, a tendency to share and spread wealth and to manipulate others and oneself. Instead of rational and irrational but overt authority, we find anonymous authority the authority of public opinion in the market. Instead of the individual conscience, the need to adjust and be approved of, instead of the sense of pride and mastery, an ever-increasing, though mainly unconscious sense of powerlessness. If we look back at the pathological problems of 19th century man, they are, of course, closely related to the peculiarities of his social character. The exploitative and hoarding attitude caused human suffering and lack of respect for the dignity of man. It caused Europe, sorry, it caused Europe to exploit Africa and Asia and her own working class ruthless, ruthlessly and without regard for human values. The other pathogenic phenomenon of the 19th century, the role of rational authority and the need to submit to it led to the repression of thoughts and feelings which were tabooed by society. The most obvious symptom was the repression of sex and all that was natural in the body, movements, dress, architectural style, and so on. This repression resulted, as Freud thought, in various forms of neurotic pathology. The reform movements of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th, which tried to cure social pathology, started from these main symptoms. All forms of socialism, from anarchism to Marxism, emphasize the necessity for abolishing exploitation and transforming the working man into an independent, free, and respected human being. They believe that if economic suffering were abolished, and if the working man were free from the domination of the capitalist, all the positive achievements of the 19th century would come to their full fruition, while the vices would disappear. In the very same way, Freud believed that if sexual repression were considerably diminished, neuro neuroses and all forms of mental sickness would be diminished in consequence, even though in his later life, his original optimism became more and more reduced. The liberals believed that complete freedom from irrational authorities would usher in a new millennium. The prescriptions for the care of human ills given by the liberals, the socialists, and the psychoanalysts different as they were from each other, nevertheless fit into the pathology and symptom symptomatology characteristic of the 19th century. What was more natural than to expect that by abolishing exploitation and economic suffering, or by doing away with sexual repression and rational authority, men would enter into an era of great freedom, or greater freedom, happiness, and progress than he had had in the 19th century. Half a century has passed, and the main demands of the 19th century reformers have been fulfilled. Speaking of the economically most progressive country, the United States, the economic exploitation of the masses has disappeared to a degree which would have sounded fantastic in Marx's time. The working class, instead of falling behind in the economic development of the whole society, has an increasing share in the national wealth, and it is a perfectly valid assumption that provided no major catastrophe occurs. There will, in about one or two generations, be no more marked poverty in the United States. Aw. Poor Eric Fromm was dead wrong with that one. 
closely related to the increasing abolishment of economic suffering is the fact that the human and political situation of the worker has changed drastically. Largely through his unions, he has become a social partner of management. No. Also, not say that's true. He cannot be ordered around, fired, abused, as he was even 30 years ago. He can be. <laughs> and he often is. He certainly does not look up anymore to the boss as if he were a higher and superior being. He neither worships him nor hates him, although he might envy him for the greater advances he has made in the attainment of the socially desirable aims. As far as submission to a rational authority goes, the picture has changed drastically since the 19th century, as far as parent-child relations are concerned. Children are not Children are no longer afraid of their parents. Again, not necessarily correct. They are companions. Nope. And if anybody feels slightly uneasy, it is not the child, but the parents who fear not being up to date. In industry, as well as in the army, there is a spirit of teamwork and equality which would have seemed unbelievable 50 years ago. In addition to all that, sexual repression has diminished to a to a remarkable degree. After the First World War, a sexual revolution took place in which old inhibitions and principles were thrown overboard. The idea of not satisfying a sexual wish was supposed to be old-fashioned or unhealthy. Even though there was a certain reaction against this attitude, on the whole, the 19th century system of taboos and repressions has almost disappeared. Looked upon from the standards of the 19th century, we have achieved almost everything which seemed to be necessary for a saner society. And indeed, many people who still think in terms of the past century are convinced that we continue to progress. Consequently, they also believe that the only threat to further progress lies in authoritarian societies, like the Soviet Union, which, with its ruthless economic exploitation of workers for the sake of quicker accumulation of capital, and the ruthless political authority necessary for the continuation of exploitation resembles in many ways the earlier phase of capitalism. <clears throat> Sorry, I lost my spot. Um, for those, however, who do not look at our present society with the eyes of the 19th century, it is obvious that the fulfillment of the 19th century hopes has by no means led to the expected results. In fact, it seems that in spite of material prosperity, political and sexual freedom, the world in the middle of the 20th century is mentally sicker than it was in the 19th century. Indeed, we are not in danger of becoming slaves anymore, but of becoming robots, as Adley Stevenson said so succinctly. There is no overt authority which intimidates us, but we are, but we are governed by the fear of the anonymous authority of conformity. We do not submit to anyone personally. We do not go through conflicts with authority, but we have also no convictions of our own, almost no individuality, almost no sense of self. Quite obviously, the diagnosis of our pathology cannot follow the lines of the 19th century. We have to recognize the specific pathological problems of our time in order to arrive at a vision of that which is necessary to save the Western world from an increasing insanity. This diagnosis will be attempted in the following section, dealing with the social character of Western man in the 20th century. C. 20th century society. 1. Social and economic changes. Drastic changes in industrial techniques, economy, and social structure have occurred in capitalism between the 19th and the middle of the 20th century. The changes in the character of man are not less drastic and fundamental. While we have already mentioned certain changes from 19th to 20th century capitalism, changes in the form of exploitation, in the form of authority, in the role of possessiveness, the following discussion will deal with those economic and characterological, characterological features 
of contemporary capitalism, which are the most fundamental ones in our time, even though they may have their origins in the 19th century or even earlier. To begin with a negative statement, in contemporary Western society, the feudal traits are disappearing more and more, and the pure form of capitalistic society thus becomes further apparent. However, the absence of feudal remnants is still much more marked in the United States than in Western Europe. Capitalism in the United States is not only more powerful and more advanced than in Europe, it is also the model toward which European capitalism is developing. It is such a model not because Europe is trying to imitate it, but because it is the most progressive form of capitalism, freed from feudal remnants and shackles. The feudal heritage has, aside from its obvious negative qualities, many human traits, which, compared with the attitude produced by pure capitalism, are exceedingly attractive. European criticism of the United States is based essentially on the older human values of feudalism, inasmuch as they are still alive in Europe. It is a criticism of the present in the name of the past which is rapidly disappearing in Europe itself. The difference between Europe and the United States in this respect is only the difference between an older and a newer phase of capitalism, between a capitalism still blended with feudal remnants and a pure form of it. The most obvious change from the 19th to the 20th century is the technical change, the increased use of the steam engine. <coughs> Um, of the combustion motor, of electricity, and the beginning of the use of atomic energy. The development is characterized by the increasing replacement of manual work by machine work, and beyond that, of human intelligence by machine intelligence. While in 1850 men supplied 15% of the energy for work, animals 79%, and machines 6% respectively. In the middle of the 20th century, we find an increasing tendency to employ automatically regulated machines, which have their own brains, and which bring about a fundamental change in the whole process of production. The technical change in the mode of production is caused by, and in its turn necessitates, an increasing concentration of capital. The decrease in number and importance of smaller firms is in direct proportion to the increase of big economic colossi. A few figures may help to make concrete the picture, which, in its general outline, is very well known. A 573 independent American corporations covering most stocks traded on the New York Stock Exchange in 1930. 130 companies controlled more than 80% of the assets of all the companies represented. The 200 largest non-banking corporations control nearly half of all non-banking non corporate wealth, while the remaining half was owned by the more than 300,000 smaller companies. It must further be remembered that the influence of one of these huge companies extends far beyond the assets under its direct control. Smaller companies which sell to or buy from the larger companies are likely to be influenced by them to a vastly greater extent than by other smaller companies with which they might deal. In many cases, the continued prosperity of the smaller company depends on the favor of the larger, and almost inevitably the interests of the latter become the interests of the former. The influence of the larger company on prices is often greatly increased by its mere size, even though it does not begin to approach monopoly. Its political influence may be tremendous. Therefore, if roughly half of the corporate wealth is controlled by 200 large corporations and half by smaller companies, it is fair to assume that very much more than half of industry is dominated by these great units. This concentration is made even more significant when it is recalled that as a result of it, approximately 2,000 individuals out of a population of 125 million are in a position to control and direct half of industry. This concentration of power has been growing since 1933 and has yet not come to a stop. The number of self-employed entrepreneurs has decreased considerably. 
While in the beginning of the 19th century, approximately four-fifths of the occupied population were self-employed entrepreneurs. Around 1870, only one-third belonged to this group, and by 1940, this old middle class comprised only one-fifth of the occupied population. That is to say, only 25% of its relative strength a hundred years earlier. 27,000 giant firms, constituting only 1% of all the firms in the United States, employ over 50% of all people engaged in business today. While on the other hand, 1,500,000 one-man enterprises, non-farming, employ only 6% of all people employed in business. As these figures already indicate, with the concentration of enterprises goes an enormous increase of employees in these big enterprises. While the old middle class, composed of farmers, independent businessmen, and professionals, formerly constituted 85% of the middle class, it is now only 44%. The new middle classes have increased from 15% to 56% in the same period. This new middle class is composed of managers, who have risen from 2% to 6%, salaried professionals from 4% to 14%, salespeople from 7% to 14%, and office workers from 2% to 22%. Altogether, the new middle class has risen from 6% to 25% of the total labor force between 1870 and 1940, while the wage workers have declined from 61% to 55% of the labor force, within the same period. As Mills puts it very succinctly, fewer individuals manipulate things, more handle people and symbols. With the increase in the importance, with the increase in the importance of the giant enterprises, another development of utmost importance has occurred. The increasing separation of management from ownership this point is illustrated by revealing figures in the classic work of Burl and Means. Of 144 companies for which information could be obtained among the 200 largest companies in 1930, only 20 had under 5,000 stockholders, while 71 had between 20,000 and 500,000 stockholders. Only in small companies did the management appear to hold an important stock interest, while in the large and that is to say the most important companies, there is an almost complete separation between stock ownership and management. In some of the largest railroad and utility companies in 1929, the size of the largest holding by any one stockholder did not exceed 2.74%, and this condition, according to Burl and Means, exists also in the industrial field. When the, when the industries are arranged in order of the average size of the management's holdings of stock, the proportion held by the officers and directors is seen to vary in almost exactly inverse ratio to the average size of the companies under consideration, with only two major exceptions. The larger the size of the company, the smaller was the proportion of the stock held by the management. In the railroads, with common stock averaging 52 million dollars per company the holdings of the management amounted to 1.4 percent and in miscellaneous mining and querying it amounted to 1.8 percent only where the companies are small did the management appear to hold important stock interest the holdings of the latter amounted to less than 20 percent except in industries with companies having an average capital under 1 million while but three industrial groups, each composed of companies averaging less than $200,000, showed directors and officers owning more than half the stock. Taking the two tendencies, that of the relative increase of big enterprise and of the smallness of management holdings of big enterprises together, it is quite evident that the general trend is increasingly one in which the owner of capital is separate from the management. How the management controls the enterprise in spite of the fact that it does not own a considerable part is a sociological and psychological problem which will be taken up later on. Another fundamental change from 19th century to contemporary capitalism is the increase in significance of the domestic market. 
Our whole economic machine rests upon the principle of mass production and mass consumption. While in the 19th century the general tendency was to save and not to indulge in expenses, which could not be paid for immediately, the contemporary system is exactly the opposite. Everybody is coaxed into buying as much as he can, and before he has saved enough to pay for his purchases. The need for more consumption is strongly stimulated by advertising and all other methods of psychological pressure. This development goes hand in hand with the rise of the economic and social status of the working class, especially in the United States, but also all over Europe. The working class has participated in the increased production of the whole economic system. The salary of the worker and his social benefits permit him a level of consumption which would have seemed fantastic 100 years ago. His social and economic power has increased to the same degree, and this not only with regard to salary and social benefits, but also to his human and social role in the factory. Let us take another look at the most important elements in the 20th century capitalism. The disappearance of feudal traits, the revolutionary increase in industrial production, the increasing concentration of capital and bigness of business and government, the increasing number of people who manipulate figures and people, the separation of ownership from management, the rise of the working class economically and politically, the new methods of work in factory and office. And let us describe these changes from a slightly different perspective or a different aspect, sorry. The disappearance of feudal factors means the disappearance of irrational authority. Um, I don't understand how that's true, but okay. Nobody is supposed to be higher than his neighbor by birth. God's will, natural law. Everybody is equal and free. What? Is this supposed to be sarcasm? <laughs> I don't understand. Nobody may be exploited or commanded by virtue of a natural right. If one person is commanded by another, it is because the commanding one bought the labor of the services or the services of the commanded one on the labor market. He commands because they are both free and equal and thus could enter into a contractual relationship. However, with a rational authority, rational authority becomes obsolete too. If the market and the contract regulates relationships, There is no need to know what is right and what is wrong and good and evil. All that is necessary is to know that things are fair, that the exchange is fair, and that things work, that they function. Another decisive fact which the 20th century man experiences is the miracle of production. He commands forces thousands of times stronger than the ones nature had given him before. Steam, oil, electricity have become his servants and beasts of burden. He crosses the oceans, the continents, first in weeks, then in days, now in hours. He seemingly overcomes the law of gravity and flies through the air. He converts deserts into fertile lands, makes rain instead of praying for it. The miracle of production leads to the miracle of consumption. No more traditional barriers keep anyone from buying anything he takes a fancy to. He only needs to have the money. But more and more people have the money, not for the genuine pearls, perhaps, but for the synthetic ones, for Fords which look like Cadillacs, for the cheap dresses which look like the expensive ones, for cigarettes which are the same for millionaires and for the working men. Everything is within reach, can be bought, can be consumed. Where was there ever a society where this miracle happened? Men work together. Thousands stream into the industrial plants and the offices. They come in cars, in subways, in buses, in trains. They work together according to a rhythm measured by the experts, with methods worked out by the experts. Not too fast, not too slow, but together, each a part of the whole. The evening stream flows back. They read the same newspaper. They listen to the radio. They see the the movies. The same for those on the top and for those at the bottom of the ladder, for the intelligent and the stupid, for the educated and the uneducated. Produce, consume, enjoy together in step without asking questions. That is the rhythm of their lives. What kind of men, then, does our society need? 
What is the social character suited to 20th century capitalism? It needs men who cooperate smoothly in large groups, who want to consume more and more, and whose tastes are standardized and can be easily influenced and, and anticipated. It needs men who feel free and independent, not subject to any authority or principle or conscience, yet willing to be commanded to do what is expected, to fit into the social machine without friction. How can man be guided without force, led without leaders, be prompted without any aim, except the one to be on the move, to function, to go ahead? 2. Characterological Changes a. Quantification, Abstractification In analyzing and describing the social character of contemporary man, one can choose any number of approaches, just as one does in describing the character structure of an individual. These approaches can differ either in the depth to which the analysis penetrates, or they can be centered around different aspects which are equally deep, yet chosen according to the particular interest of the investigator. In the following analysis, I have chosen the concept of alienation as the central point from which I am going to develop the analysis of the contemporary social character. For one reason, because this concept seems to me to touch upon the deepest level of the modern personality. For another, because it is the most appropriate if one is concerned with the interaction between the contemporary socio-economic economic structure and the character structure of the average individual. We must introduce the discussion of alienation by speaking of one of the fundamental economic features of capitalism, the process of quantification and abstractification. The medieval artisan produced goods for a relatively small and known group of customers. His prices were determined by the need to make a profit, which permitted him to live in a style traditionally commensurate with his social status. He knew from experience the costs of production, and even if he employed a few journeymen and apprentices, no elaborate system of bookkeeping or balance sheets was required for the operation of his business. <clears throat> the same held true for the production of the peasant, which required even less quantifying abstract methods. In contrast, the modern business enterprise rests upon its balance sheet. It cannot rest upon such concrete and direct observation as the artisan used to figure out his profits. Raw material, machinery, labor costs, as well as the product, can be expressed in the same money value, and thus made comparable and fit to appear in the balance equation. All economic occurrences have to be strictly quantifiable, and only the balance sheets, the exact comparison of economic processes, quantified in figures, Tell the manager whether and to what degree he is engaged in a profitable, that is to say, a meaningful business activity. This transformation of the concrete into the abstract has developed far beyond the balance sheet and the quantification of the economic occurrences in the sphere of production. The modern businessman not only deals with millions of dollars, but also with millions of customers, thousands of stockholders, and thousands of workers and employees. All these people become so many pieces in a gigantic machine, which must be controlled, whose effects must be calculated. Each man eventually can be expressed as an abstract entity, as a figure, and on this basis, economic occurrences are calculated, trends are predicted, decisions are made. Today, when only about 20% of our working population is self-employed, the rest work for somebody else, and a man's life is dependent on someone who pays him a wage or a salary. But we should say something instead of someone because a worker is hired and fired by an institution, the managers of which are impersonal parts of the enterprise, rather than people in personal contact with the men they employ. Let us not forget another fact. In pre-capitalistic society, exchange was to a large extent one of goods and services. Today, all work is rewarded with money. The close fabric of economic relations is regulated by money, the abstract expression of work. That is to say, we receive different quantities of the same for different qualities, and we give money for what we receive. Again, exchanging only different quantities for different qualities. 
Practically nobody, with the exception of the farm population, could live for even a few days without receiving and spending money, which stands for the abstract quality of concrete work. Another aspect of capitalist production, which results in increasing abstractification, is the increasing division of labor. Division of labor as a whole exists in most known economic systems, and even in most primitive communities, in the form of division of labor between the sexes. What is characteristic of capitalistic production is the degree to which this division has developed. While in the medieval economy there was division of labor, let us say between agricultural production and the work of the artisan, there, <clears throat> there was little such there was little such division within each sphere of production itself. The carpenter making a chair or table made the whole chair or the whole table. And, and even if some preparatory work was done by his apprentices, he was in control of the production, overseeing it in its entirety. In the modern industrial enterprise, <coughs> in the modern industrial enterprise, the worker is not <clears throat> the worker is not in touch with the whole product at any point. He is engaged in the performance of one specialized function, and while he might shift in the course of time from one function to another, he is still not related to the concrete product as a whole. He develops a specialized function, and the tendency is such that the function of the modern industrial worker can be defined as working in a machine-like fashion, in activities for which, for which machine work has not yet been devised, or which would be costlier than human work. The only person who is in touch with the whole product is the manager, but to him the product is an abstraction, whose essence is exchange value while well, the worker for whom it is concrete never works on it as a whole. <clears throat> Undoubtedly, without quantification and, uh, and abstractification, modern mass production would be unthinkable. But in a society in which economic activities have become the main preoccupation of man, this process of quantification and, and abstractification has transcended the realm of economic production and spread to the attitude of man to, and spread to the attitude of man to things to people and to himself in order to understand the abstractification process in modern man we must first consider the ambiguous function of abstraction in general it is obvious that abstractions in themselves are not a modern phenomenon in fact, an increasing ability to form abstractions is characteristic of the cultural development of the human race. If I speak of a table, I am using an abstraction. I am referring not to a specific table in its full concreteness, but to the genus table, which comprises all possible concrete tables. If I speak of a man, I am not speaking of this or that person, in his concreteness and uniqueness, but of the genus, man, which comprises all individual persons. In other words, I make an abstraction. The development of philosophical or scientific thought is based on an increasing ability for such, for such abstractification, and to give it up would mean to fall back into the most primitive way of thinking. However, there are two ways of relating oneself to an object. One can relate oneself to it in its full concreteness. Then the object appears with all its specific qualities, and there is no other object which is identical with it. And one can relate oneself to the object in an abstract way, that is, emphasizing only those qualities which it has in common with all other objects of the same genus, and thus accentuating some and ignoring other qualities. The full and productive relatedness to an object comprises this polarity of perceiving it in its uniqueness, and at the same time in its generality, in its concreteness, and at the same time in its abstractness. In contemporary Western culture, this polarity has given way to an almost exclusive reference to the abstract qualities of things and people, and to a neglect of relating oneself to their concreteness and uniqueness. 
Instead of forming abstract concepts where it is necessary and useful, everything, including ourselves, is being abstractified. The concrete reality of people and things to which we can relate with the reality of our own person is replaced by abstractions, by ghosts that embody different quantities but not different qualities. It is quite customary to talk about a $3 million bridge, a 20 cent cigar, a $5 watch. And this not only from the standpoint of the manufacturer or the consumer in the process of buying it, but as the essential point in the description. When one speaks of the $3 million bridge, one is not primarily concerned with its usefulness or beauty, that is, with its concrete qualities, but one speaks of it as, a, as of a commodity, the main quality of which is its exchange value, expressed in a quantity, that of money. This does not mean, of course, that one is not concerned also with the usefulness or beauty of the bridge, but it does mean that its concrete use value is secondary to its abstract exchange value in the way the object is experienced. The famous line by Gertrude Stein, a rose is a rose is a rose, is a protest against this abstract form of experience. For most people, a rose is just not a rose, but a flower in a certain price range to be bought on, a certain, social on certain social occasions. Even the most beautiful flower, provided it is a wild one, costing nothing is not experienced in its beauty compared to that of the rose, because it has no exchange value. In other words, things are experienced as commodities, as embodiments of exchange value, not only while we are buying or selling, but in our attitude toward them when the economic transaction is finished. A thing, even after it has been bought, never quite loses its quality as commodity in this sense. It is expendable, always retaining its exchange value quality. A good illustration of this attitude is to be found in a report of the executive secretary of an important scientific organization as to how he spent a day in his office. The organization had just bought and moved into a building of their own. The executive secretary reports that during one of the first days after they had moved into the building, he got a call from a real estate agent, saying that some people were interested in buying the building and wanted to look at it. Although he knew that it was most unlikely that the organization would want to sell the building a few days after they had moved in, he could not resist the temptation to know whether the value of the building had risen since they had bought it, and spent one or two valuable hours in showing the real estate agent around. He writes, Very interested in fact we can get an offer for more than we have put in building. Nice coincidence that offer comes while treasurer is in the office. All agree it will be good for board's morale to learn that the, that the building will sell for a good deal more than it cost. Let's see what happens. In spite of all the pride and pleasure in the new building, it had still retained its quality as a commodity, as something expendable, and to which no full sense of possession or use is attached. The same attitude is obvious in the relationship of people to the cars they buy. The car never becomes fully a thing to which one is attached, but retains its quality as a commodity to be exchanged in a successful bargain. Thus, cars are sold after a year or two, long before their use value is exhausted or even considerably diminished. This abstractification takes place even with regard to phenomena which are not commodities sold on the market. Like a flood disaster, the newspapers will headline a flood, speaking of a million-dollar catastrophe, emphasizing the abstract quantitative element rather than the concrete aspect of human suffering. But the abstractifying and quantifying attitude goes far beyond the realm of things. People are also experienced as the embodiment of a quantitative exchange value. To speak of man as being worth $1 million is to speak of him not any more as a concrete human person, but as an abstraction, whose essence can be expressed in a figure. It is an expression of the same attitude when a newspaper headlines an obituary with the words, Shoe Manufacturer Dies. Actually, a man has died, a man with certain human qualities, with hopes and frustrations, with a wife and children. 
It is true that he manufactured shoes, or rather that he owned and managed a factory in which workers served machines manufacturing shoes. But if it is said that a shoe manufacturer dies, the richness and concreteness of a human life is expressed in the abstract formula of economic function. The same abstractifying approach can be seen in expressions like Mr. Nord or Mr. Sorry, Mr. Ford produced so many automobiles or this or that general conquered a fortress. Or if a man has a house built for himself, he says, I built a house. Concretely speaking, Mr. Ford did not manufacture the automobiles. He directed automobile production, which was executed by thousands of workers. The general never conquered the fortress. He was sitting in his headquarters, issuing orders, and his soldiers did the conquering. The man did not build a house. He paid the money to an architect who made the plans and to workers who did the building. All this is not said to minimize the significance of the managing and directing operations, but in order to indicate that in this way of experiencing things, sight of what goes on concretely is lost, and an abstract view is taken in which one function, that of making plans, giving orders, or financing an activity, is identified with the whole concrete process of production, or of fighting, or of building, as the case may be. The same process of abstractification takes place in all other spheres. The New York Times recently printed a news item under the heading a Bachelor of Science plus PhD equals $40,000. The information under this somewhat baffling heading was that statistical data showed that a student of engineering who has acquired his doctor's degree will earn, in a lifetime, $40,000 more than a man who has only the degree of Bachelor of Sciences. As far as this is a fact, it is an interesting socioeconomic datum, worthwhile reporting. It is mentioned here because the way of expressing the fact as an equation between a scientific degree and a certain amount of dollars is indicative of the abstractifying and quantifying thinking in which knowledge is experienced as the embodiment of a certain exchange value on the personality market. It is to the same point when a political report in a news magazine states that the Eisenhower administration feels it has so much capital of confidence that it can risk some unpopular measures because it can afford to lose some of that confidence capital. Here again, a human quality like confidence is expressed in its ab abstract form as if it were a money investment to be dealt with in terms of a market, specu a market speculation. How drastically commercial categories have entered even religious thinking is shown in the following passage by Bishop Sheen. <laughs> oh, random hiccup, sorry. In an article on the birth of Christ. Our reason tells us, so writes the author, that if any one of the claimants for the role of God's son came from God, the least that God could do to support his representative's claim would be to pre-announce his coming. Automobile automobile manufacturers tell us when to expect a new model or even more drastically billy graham the evangelist says i am selling the greatest product in the world why shouldn't it be promoted as well as as well as soap the process of abstractification however has still deeper roots and manifestations than the ones described so far roots which go back to the very beginning of the modern era to the dissolution of any concrete frame of reference in the process of life. In a primitive society, the world is identical with the tribe. The tribe is in the center of the universe, as it were. Everything outside is shadowy and has no independent existence. In the medieval world, the universe ha was much wider. It comprised this globe, the sky and the stars above it, but it was seen with the earth as the center and man as the purpose of creation. Everything had its fixed place, just as everybody has or had his fixed position in feudal society. With the 15th and 16th centuries, new vistas opened up. The earth lost its central place and became one of the satellites of the sun. New continents were found, new sea lanes discovered. The static social system was more and more loosened up. Everything and everybody was moving. Yet until the end of the 20th century, nature and society 
<clears throat> nature and society had not lost their concreteness and definite, definiteness. Man's natural and social world was still manageable, still had definite contours. But with the progress in scientific thought, technical discoveries, and the dissolution of all traditional bonds, this definiteness and, and concreteness is in the process of being lost. Whether we think of our new cosmological picture, or of theoretical physics, or of a tonal music, or abstract art, the concreteness and definitiveness of our frame of reference is disappearing. We are not any more in the center of the universe. We are not any more the purpose of creation. We are not any more the masters of a manageable and recognizable world. We are a speck of dust. We are a nothing, somewhere in space, without any kind of concrete relatedness to anything. We speak of millions of people being killed, of one third or more of our population being wiped out if a third world war should occur. We speak of billions of dollars piling up as a national debt, of thousands of light years as interplanetary distances, of interspace travel, of artificial satellites. Tens of thousands work in one enterprise, hundreds of thousands live in hundreds of cities. The dimensions with which we deal are figures and abstractions. They are far beyond the boundaries which would permit of any kind of, any kind of concrete experience. There is no frame of reference left which is manageable, observable, which is adapted to human dimensions. While our eyes and ears receive impressions only in humanly manageable proportions, our concept of the world has lost just that quality. It does not any longer correspond to our human dimensions. This is especially significant in connection with the development of modern means of destruction. In modern war, one individual can cause the destruction of hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children. He could do so by pushing a button. He may not feel the emotional impact of what he is doing, since he does not see, does not know the people whom he kills. It is almost as if his act of pushing the button and their death had no real connection. The same man would probably be incapable of even slapping, not to speak of killing a helpless person. In the latter case, the concrete situation arouses in him a conscience rea conscious reaction common to all normal men. In the former, there is no such reaction, because the act and his object are alienated from the doer. His act is not his any more, but has, so to speak, a life and a responsibility of its own. Science, business, politics have lost all foundations and proportions which make sense humanly. We live in figures and abstractions, since nothing is concrete, nothing is real. Everything is possible, factually and morally. Science fiction is not different from science fact. Nightmares and dreams from the events of next year. Man has been thrown out f from any definite place, whence he can overlook and manage his life and the life of society. He is driven faster and faster by the forces which originally were created by him. In this wild world, he thinks, figures busy with abstractions more and more remote from concrete life.